my name is Laziza Thielen. I'm a supervisory official for the FIU. Today I'm going to be holding the presentation together with my supervisory official colleague, uh, Mr. Thomas Riemersma. Before I get into the presentation, I would like to point out that this presentation is very straight to the point. We are only going to highlight the most important topics because after the um, information session we are going to schedule um, individual one-on-one -on -one meetings with each and every one of you so we can get into more detail. So um, today we are going to um, discuss um, a little bit about the terms money laundering and terrorism financing in the introduction. Then we're going to talk about the anti-money laundering and counter-financing of terrorism uh, legal framework here in St. Martin. We're going to um, uh, tell you a little bit about what the FIU does, the services that are relevant for the accountants, uh, compliance requirements, uh, the next steps of the supervision, and we're going to um, close uh, with some recent events. Now, I think we are all familiar with money laundering and terrorism financing. Money laundering is basically um, processing uh, the proceeds of crime to hide or disguise their illegal origin. Uh, most of the people, they associate money laundering with the laundering of drug money. But it's not only drug money, it's um, the proceeds of any criminal offense, such for example, uh, tax evasion. Terrorism financing is uh, basically directly or indirectly willingly uh, providing or collecting funds for terrorist activities. For example, uh, when you donate funds to a church or a foundation that supports, uh, supports uh, terrorist groups. Worldwide, there is uh, awareness for the prevention of money laundering and terrorism financing. The International Organization Financial Action Task Force, in short, the FATF, has issued uh, rules, um, we call them the recommendations, that need to be implemented in the national legislations of the member countries. Um, according to recommendation 29, a member country needs to establish a national center for the receipt and analysis of unusual transactions or suspicious transactions. Before uh, 101010, there was a central FIU, um, because the, the national center we call the FIU, Financial Intelligence Unit. So there was a national center um, uh, for receipt and analysis of UTRs. Um, for the Netherlands Antilles. There was a FIU for the Netherlands Antilles. Um, after 101010, that St. Martin and uh, Curacao became a country, uh, St. Martin established its own uh, FIU and Curacao remained with its FIU. Now, since 2011, um, St. Martin is a member of the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, the CFATF, which is a regional counterpart of counterpart of the uh, FATF. Um, recently, in January 2013, we had uh, our mutual evaluation. So St. Martin, as a jurisdiction, was evaluated to see uh, whether it complied with the FATF recommendation. Now, St. Martin scored so-so, uh, uh, so not very well. Out of the 16 key and core recommendations, uh, we only met uh, two of them, and the main reason is because our legislation was not up to date with the FATF standards. So whenever we um, refer to the recommendation in uh, this presentation, is because we are currently still updating our legislation to implement it um, in our framework. Now, the relevant uh, AML CFT legislation for St. Martin is the National Ordinance Reporting Unusual Transactions, in short, NORUD, which contains uh, rules about reporting unusual transactions. The National Ordinance Identification When Rendering Services, the NOISE, contains uh, rules about the identification of the client or the ultimate beneficial owner. Um, in the near future, the NORUT and the NOISE are going to merge, uh, so we get one uh, big AML-CFT uh, law. 
Then we have the ministerial degree on indicators, which was recently amended in 2016. And it is based on Article 10 of the NORUD, and it contains um, indicators that can be used uh, when reporting unusual transactions to the FIU. Um, of course, we have the Penal Code of St. Martin, which contains uh, the criminal offenses, uh, money laundering and terrorism financing, which are applicable um, for our subject today. Um, the provisions and guidelines, the PNGs as we call it, for the non-financial entities, uh, which the FAU has issued for each sector, um, uh, they contain detailed information about the uh, compliance obligations that you have. And, it's, and it is based on Article 22H of the NORUT, um, so it is a binding uh, document. Um, last but not least, we have the sanctions degree, um, which is a um, degree that contains measures that need to be taken when dealing with persons or countries that have been sanctioned by, for example, the UN, because uh, uh, the UN issues a sanction list with names of persons, uh, organizations or countries uh, that have been sanctioned for, for example, uh, terrorism. Now, uh, the legal basis for the FIU St. Martin is situated in Article 2 of the NORUD, and that is based on a FATF Recommendation 29. Um, like I mentioned before, the FIU St. Martin uh, um, was established in 2010, and what we do is receive and we, uh, we receive and analyze um, unusual transaction reports for the financial and the non-financial institutions. An international requirement is also that an FIU is a member of the Egmont Group for FIUs. The Egmont Group basically um, regulates uh, and, and reviews if an FIU is working uh, properly. Um, recently, we have, um, we have done the Egmont Biannual Census on efficiency and effectiveness of the FIU, and there they looked at um, if our FIU here in St. Martin is operating the way it's supposed to be operating. Now, the FIU in St. Martin consists of uh, three departments. Uh, first, we have the analyst department. The analysts, they um, analyze the unusual transactions, uh, uh, transaction reports. And if they have, after their, their analysis, if they have a suspicion of money laundering or terrorism financing, they send uh, the suspicious transactions to the public prosecutor. Then the public prosecutor will decide if they're going to um, uh, proceed with a case. Then we have the supervision department. Uh, we supervise the uh, non-financial institutions. We call them the DNFPP, the Designated Non-Financial Businesses and Professions. And um, the, just to, uh, for your information, the financial institutions, they are being supervised by the central bank. Um, what we do is uh, we do outreach to the DNFPP. So we try to inform them on the AML CFT legislation. So we hold information sessions such as these. We hold one-on-one um, -on -one meetings. We uh, answer questions. And what we also do is we examine uh, them on their compliance with the AML CFT legislation. And then we have the secretariat, which assists and uh, supports uh, both departments. Um, my colleague Thomas is going to explain a little bit more about the services that are relevant for the accountants. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lucisa. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Thomas Riemsma. I'm also a supervisory official for the, for the MOD. And in this slide, I'm going to discuss with you the scope of uh, the law, as it, as it, it is uh, mentioned in uh, Article 1, uh, Park of 1A, sub-15 so of, uh, of the NORUD, uh, which gives a description of uh, the services uh, that fall under the law. And that's relevant because not all of the services that accountants uh, uh, deploy fall under this uh, article. Now, let me start by uh, reading the head of the uh, article and uh, deduct some of the uh, elements and discuss them, give some examples and... Uh, continue in that way. The text uh, says, giving advice or assistant as an independent profession or trade by a natural person, legal person or company, when, and then we have uh, four specific services. So the first ele element is giving advice 
uh, or uh, assistant. Now, giving advice is an active act. Huh? It's, it's like an accountant uh, suggesting or recommending uh, or informing a client about a particular uh, activity. For example, giving uh, advice about uh, a certain business uh, or about tax uh, issues, a tax advice that falls under that expect. Now, the second part is assistance. Giving assistance is also an active uh, element, helping, supporting a client in, in a certain uh, uh, activity. For example, uh, giving ex assistance by the setting up of an internal control procedure within a company. And uh, having said that, there are uh, activities that are performed by an accountant that are not giving advice or assistance. For example, the drawing uh, up of uh, financial statements, uh, the opstellen van de jaarrekening, that's something that is not such an active act and that falls not under the law. Maybe you have more examples, but that's at least one that I uh, would like to give. And besides, if you look at the text, the giving of uh, advice or the assistant has to be uh, related to four specific mentioned uh, activities, which I'm going to read and give an example of each one. Now, the first one is purchase, purchasing or selling of real estate. Second is managing funds, securities, coins, notes, precious stones, metals, or other values. Uh, third one is establishing and managing corporations, legal persons, or similar bodies. And the fourth one is the buying or selling or taking over of, of, of an enterprise. So only limited four. And these typical four services are picked because they are internationally considered to be attractive for criminals that want to uh, launder their uh, money and need the, the desired expertise of accountants and even other mentioned DNFVPs. So let me go to the next slide and give some examples. Uh, the first one, providing financial tax advice in the buying and selling of real estate for a client's real estate portfolio. And that goes along with the uh, advising by the purchase of selling of, of real estate. The second one is carrying out financial transactions uh, for the client. Uh, for example, the, the making of, of cash deposits, sending and receiving uh, international funds uh, uh, transfers. Here you see the, see, see the situation that an uh, accountant might be uh, misused for managing the funds of, of someone that does not want to be in, 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 in the spotlights. And the third one is purchase of company shares for a client's investment company. Now, if you go back to the services as mentioned, here we see the buying or selling uh, in, in this case and purchasing the shares that's buying uh, ownership in an enterprise and it falls under this services. Criminals like the expertise of, of an accountant eh, or an expert and uh, disguise their own presence. Sorry. Whoop. And the last example, the creation of a complex legal arrangement for an uh, international uh, client goes along with the third one, establishing and managing corporations, legal persons, or uh, similar bodies. And this could be used for a criminal uh, to uh, layer the activities, to disguise where the money is coming from, or to use an expert for, the, for, for uh, setting up uh, constructions that might disguise. All right, we have to go back to this slide because and first one, giving advice of, of, uh, or assistance with re, uh, in relation to, to those uh, four activities. But as we read on, as an independent professional trade by a natural person, legal person, or company. Now, uh, it, it has to be done professional. You're all professionals here in the case. But it could be done by a natural person, like uh, someone who is active in a uh, sole proprietorship, a manzaak. Uh, normally, the accountant is active in, in a legal person, BV, eh, or, an, or an, an NV. But uh, in the structure that we have here in uh, St. Martin, Netherlands, we also know the partnerships, maatschap, vennootschap onder firma, of the communitaire vennootschap. And these are also con considered companies that fall under the law. And if an accountant is active uh, uh, for an NV or for a partnership, then we treat the uh, organizational entity as a whole, 
we treat as, as the, 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 the company that is responsible under the scope of the law. So not the individual uh, accountants. And the fourth element that we could uh, distinguish is the independency. Some financial experts are active uh, within a company. We can mention a bank or we can mention another uh, uh, company. And if an accountant is uh, employed, then that is not considered to be independent. And therefore, for, for such a financial expert, these laws uh, do not uh, apply. It's, it's external uh, advice. All right. Let's go to this slide. There is an uh, exemption. This exemption is very uh, narrowly uh, interpreted. It's, it's only in the situation that we have an accountant acting as an independent legal uh, advisor. There is something that we call uh, client uh, attorney privilege, uh, geheimhoudingsplicht, verschoningsplicht. And this article says that if a, a client comes to an independent legal uh, advisor, uh, such as an accountant that specializes in independent legal uh, advice, this uh, clause could be uh, uh, exempting the services that are provided. Now, which services are these? Uh, not considered as service are uh, activities which are related to the provision of the legal position of a client. It's representation at law, giving advice before, during and after legal action or giving advice on instituting or avoiding a legal action, yeah, this part. So client comes to you, wants legal advice, uh, in, in court case, before court case, after court case, then it is uh, exempted. All right, now I explained uh, the scope of the law, what services fall under uh, the law. Um, if the services fall under the law, there is a consequence, and the cons consequence is, is that the, 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 the application of uh, these, these laws are part of your service. And it means that you need to have a risk-based approach. You need to have um, an, 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 an idea of what the risks might be that uh, in the service that you provide with your client, the transaction that you uh, execute, is related uh, to uh, money laundering, and you also need to have a strategy in place within your organization to mitigate these risks and these threats and, and, and vulnerabilities. Now, uh, my colleague Laziz is going to talk about uh, the risk-based approach a bit more, but first he's going to talk about uh, some issues of compliance. Are the compliance requirements uh, that you have you need to perform uh, customer due diligence, uh, get to know your client, um, have a risk assessment uh, in place, um, uh, keep records because according to the legislation, records need to be kept for at least five years. Um, the reporting of unusual transactions and having a compliance regime in place, which consists of four points, um, having a written compliance policy and internal procedures, appointing a compliance officer, having an ongoing training program for your staff, and um, the evaluation of the compliance regime. I'm uh, going to get into this, these um, uh, points um, in the next slides. Now, uh, my colleague just touched on uh, uh, the RBA, the risk-based approach. This is where you look at uh, the overall risks involved uh, for your sector, for the products um, provided, for the services provided. Um, and part of this risk-based approach is that you need to perform risk assessment on your clients when providing services. And then in relation with uh, the transactions, the products, uh, or the geographical area. So you need to have a uh, risk assessment. Now, the risk assessment goes hand in hand with the customer to D. Um, for example, um, you need the risk assessment uh, to tell you, to indicate which customer due diligence you need to perform. And on the other hand, you need certain elements of the uh, customer due diligence um, 
to answer certain questions of the risk assessment. For example, if you, um, uh, you need to identify uh, the, uh, your client or the ultimate beneficial owner, because if you don't identify them, then you, will, you would not know if, uh, what, what nationality they have. So you can't answer the question if the client uh, comes from a high risk country, uh, yes or no. So they go uh, hand in hand. Now, when you do this risk assessment, uh, you create a risk profile for each client. Now, um, this uh, risk profi profile might be um, low, medium, or high. Um, uh, an example of a low risk is when you're dealing with uh, state-owned businesses, such as GB um, uh, or the Harbor. Those are um, low risk. And in a case of a low risk, you have the possibility to perform a simplified customer due diligence. Um, but uh, you cannot perform the simplified uh, due diligence regardless of you uh, having a low risk as an outcome when you have a suspicion of money laundering or terrorism financing because then you can't perform the simplified due diligence in any case. Uh, the medium risk as an outcome indicates that you don't have a low risk and you don't have a high risk. And in that case, you perform a standard customer due diligence. Um, but the most um, important one of all is when you have a high risk, because in that case, you have to perform an enhanced customer due diligence, an extra critical, thorough approach uh, to the due diligence measures. Now, an example of a high risk is when you are dealing with a PEP, as we call it, a politically exposed person, uh, which is a person in a public prominent function, um, locally or internationally, and not only themselves as persons, but also uh, their family members or close associates. Um, uh, so like I said, in those cases, you have to perform the enhanced due diligence and ask more questions, ask for the source of funds, be extra critical. Now, when do you have to perform the customer due diligence and the risk assessment? Uh, when establishing a business relationship uh, with a client or when you carry out occasional transactions above the threshold of 25,000 kilders or above or an equivalent in other currencies. Um, when the information you already have in your files of the client is not accurate or not valid. Or when you have a suspicion of money laundering or terrorism financing. Now, um, two, uh, the two most important points of the customer due diligence is uh, identifying your client and if the client is a company, the ultimate beneficial owner of the company. Now, how do you uh, identify a natural person? By asking for a valid driver's license, identity card or passport. Now, natural persons can be um, the client themselves, representatives of companies um, and of course the ultimate beneficial owner because that will be um, a natural person uh, that holds 25% or more shares in the company. Um, if you have a company as a client, then the company needs to be identified as well. And you do that um, by asking for a certified extract of the Chamber of Commerce or a similar document um, in the country of establishment of the company. Um, but let's say if at the moment of the identification, you, um, you cannot acquire this document from the company, they cannot provide it to you, then you can draw up an identification document uh, which contains, which covers all the required information that you normally would find on a company registration document. Um, so I um, highlighted the two most important uh, uh, points of the customer due diligence. In the individual meetings, we will go into um, the rest of the customer due diligence and um, the deviation, so the simplified and the enhanced customer due diligence. Now, um, we are going to touch on these uh, subjects, the risk assessment and the CDD, um, by showing you a case example, which uh, Thomas is going to um, explain to you. Yep, thank you. Yes, uh, we uh, thought it would be uh, nice to apply the information that we gave, gave uh, thus far in a case. So let's read the case and maybe you have any suggestions. New client is requesting an accounting firm. 
uh, to perform a due diligence investigation, a DDI, for the purchasing of a company. The client, Johnny Cake BV, established in St. Martin, is represented by its director, who is a politician. The director identifies himself through a copy of a passport. It remains unclear who the UBO is. The accounting company accepts the client and starts the investigation. All right, now this, in this case, eh, you first have to establish if the service falls under the scope of the law, as I mentioned before. Here it's a D D DDI, what we consider to be an advice, and it's about taking over a company. So the fourth bullet, if you recall, applies. So this case falls under the law. Now that means that you have to uh, apply a customer due diligence, what uh, Lassiza just uh, explained. Identification is part of the customer due diligence. The question is, has the identification duty been performed properly? What do you think? Anyone? Who has to be identified first in, in this case? Who's the client? Is that the politician? Yeah, it's Johnny Cake. Johnny Cake has to be uh, uh, identified, and as you can see in this case, it has not been. Uh, Laziza also explained how it has to be identified by an excerpt extract of the Chamber of Commerce. Now, if it would be a foreign company, which it is not, it's local, and so it's fairly easy to uh, identify. Uh, let's look at the director. The, the director is a politician. Uh, did he identify himself correctly? A bit doubtful, eh? because what the text says is that he identifies himself through a copy of a passport. And remember that uh, you, as an accountant, you always have to see the valid, the original document. And you make a passport of, of the copy, eh? and, 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 and that has to be done. You have to see that the passport is valid. You have to verify the identity of the person that uh, identifies himself in front of you. So this is also not completely uh, uh, correct. Uh, third part about uh, identification here in this case is that it remains unclear uh, who the UBO is. How does an ultimate beneficiary uh, owner, uh, who is actually the real owner of the company, uh, how uh, does a UBO have to be uh, uh, identified? Anyone? It's always a natural person, so a UBO always has to be identified in the ways that Lucisa told. Uh, valid passport, identity card, or driver's license. Now, that has not happened here in this case, so no, the identification duty has not been performed properly. Second one is that uh, because of the application of the CDD, hey, you have to do a risk assessment. She explained the risk categories. You look at the client, you look at the product, you look at the transaction. And there are very professional models on the market. But if you look at this simple case, what would be your outcome? Mm -hmm.